सर प्लीज स्टार्ट सर सुखुजा इज ज्वाइनिंग सर ही टोल्ड मी दैट डॉक्टर वर्मा शुड स्टार्ट सर ओके या वी आई थिंक वी हैव गॉट 25 प्लस स्टूडेंट्स गुड इवनिंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन एंड स्टूडेंट्स इट्स अ प्लेजर टू बी विद यू अगेन एंड टुडे वी आर हैविंग सेवेंथ एपिसोड ऑफ मास्टर्स बेड साइड क्लिनिक्स इन नेफ्रोलॉजी uh today's topic is uh, a very important topic and a lot of work has gone in this field but still there are no firm guidelines no master strokes in that what should be done and most of us treat the way majority is treating the way it is truly appealing to discuss the issue of graft dysfunction we have kept the topic open graft dysfunction so that we can discuss both acute and chronic graft dysfunction uh we have got two very very learned very respected and may i use the word brilliant nephrologist from chennai professor n gopal krishnan and professor edwin fernandos Uh, i think the whole of indian community of nephrologists knows them and respects them they are very learned teachers very eloquent speakers and uh, sort of the teachers i'll say i was just talking to them professor gopal krishnan and team they have trained over 72 nephrologists and professor edwin and team more than 21 nephrologists it only goes to prove the research mind and the fertile minds they have got i will and to discuss the case today uh, is a student of professor gopal krishna he is uh, mr uh, dr p vasali vatsalyan uh, i hope i am pronouncing it correct uh, he will be discussing the case today's moderator is also professor sakuja and professor kheer who shall be joining shortly but meanwhile i'll hand over the mic and the presentation to today's presenter uh, dr p basanya go ahead please good evening everyone what's uh, alin uh, before that um, thank you professor varma for those kind uh, words and compliments uh, let me just give some brief uh, uh, kind of instruction uh, to dr vatsalyan the structure of today's program will be uh, totally 1 hour and 15 minutes so uh, you will be giving uh, uh, presenting the the total clinical course of this patient um roughly about maximum 10 to 20 uh, 12 minutes to 14 minutes or so so that we'll have ample time for discussion so at the end of your discussion you will be asked to come out with your impression uh, diagnosis or the list of problems this patient has gone through uh, following post uh, following uh, kidney transplantation then you'll be asked to Uh, present your clinical present examination findings at the end of the clinical examination again if you are if you want to add any other uh, phenomenon to the problem list you can do that then we'll start the discussion okay fine and myself and dr edwin both will be examining simultaneously please go ahead Is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah, it is visible. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am presenting a case. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Ye, forty-seven year old lady from Chennai, studied up to become currently unemployed. Was admitted with complaints of vomiting for for the for the past four days, swelling of legs for the past two days, and exertional breathlessness for the past two days. I would like to start my history from twenty fourteen. in 2014 patient had headache at that time she has consulted a physician at that time she was found to be hypertensive with bp of 160 per 100 and she has found to be incidentally found to have renal failure her creatinine of 1.9 and she was also told to have proteinuria but she was not uh, able to quantify the uh, remember the amount of uh, quantum of proteinuria and the renal biopsy was attempted however no tissue was obtained 
Since she was initiated on tablet uh, amlodipine and tablet uh, enalapril, and she was on regular follow. -up. In two thousand seventeen, patient uh, went into ESKD stage, and she is uh, initiated on maintenance hemodialysis, uh, CKD five D on maintenance hemodialysis weekly twice with HD axis of two axes, uh, right IJV HD catheter and left RC fistula, two dialysis center with dialysis vintage of one year, viral markers were negative, dry weight of forty two kg. She uh, received regular iron and EPO injections, and she has not received any blood transfusion. She has received hepatitis B vaccination, and there was no emergency admissions during the dialysis. Meanwhile, she was uh, worked up for a live-related renal transplant with spouse's uh, potential donor, and who was uh, ABO compatible. Both were uh, B positive, and there was no issues during workup. In July 2018, a patient underwent live-related renal transplantation, which was ABO compatible, spouse donor, and the patient says uh, she had a prolonged surgery, and there was some uh, uh, plaque was there, and it was removed during the surgery. So she remembers that in post-op period, uh, she uh, she was given IV heparin for four days. However, uh, after her surgery, she had good urine output. However, uh, her creatinine was persistently above normal, and it, she remembers it to be around 3.2. At the end of one week, hence allograft biopsy was done, and she was told that she didn't have any rejection, and her discharge rate was 2.8. She was discharged on day 10 with uh, prednisolone, tacrolimus, and mycophenidate infusion. In August 2018, that is one one month post transplant, she attained uh, she tested nadir creatinine of 1.2 to 1.3. Three months post transplant, patient uh, developed uh, asymptomatic bacteriuria. Uh, which was incidentally for urine analysis showed the presence of plus cells and urine culture showed klebsiella pneumoniae which was sensitive to nitrofurantoin and she was initiated on nitrofurantoin she didn't have any graft dysfunction at that time seven months post transplant patient developed acute graft dysfunction at that time as creatinine was rising from 1.2 to 2.5 and uh, she remembers uh, allograft uh, biopsy was done and she was told to have rejection and she was uh, she was told that she needs to be treated with an, some iv injection for uh, three consecutive days followed by uh, she was initiated on uh, therapeutics uh, which required uh, yellowish uh, fluid supplementation along with uh, administration of uh, 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 iv uh, injections post procedure and she also received uh, special injections probably uh, rituximab uh, and uh, bartosome she, she remembers that it was given on for plan to be given on four days Uh, for three days apart, however, uh, only two. It was given only for two days. So uh, her discharge creatinine was two point one. Ten months post transplant, uh, patient developed fever, malaise, diarrhea, and uh, she was uh, ordered for CMB and CMB PCR was found to be uh, positive. Mean meanwhile, USG KUB done showed presence of obstructive. Uh, uh, she was uh, remembering that there there was some obstruction in the ureter. And again, she remembered that her BKV was done, which was found to be negative. And this time also, she was she presented with acute graft dysfunction with uh, admission creatinine of five and discharge creatinine of three. And uh, one month later, uh, she was uh, planned and uh, DJ stenting insertion was done. Uh, after DJ stenting insertion, her uh, baseline creatinine went from three uh, to one point seven to two. One year, six months post transplant, uh, uh, her uh, serum creatinine was two and uh, DJ stent was removed. One year, seven months post transplant, patient presented with vomiting. At that time, uh, she was found to have acute and chronic graft dysfunction. This time, her admission rate was nine point five. CT KB done showed presence of obstruction with no evidence of any infection. Urine culture was negative. She was initiated on three sessions of hemodialysis and uh, IV meropenem uh, for uh, seven days. And uh, she was uh, DJ stenting insertion was done. At that time, her discharge rate was three, and she was non-alcoholic. Uh, following a discharge, her baseline rate again went into one point five milligram per deciliter. A two-year, four months post-transplant patient developed fever, breathlessness with O2 requirement, and a COVID swab was found to be a positive, and CT suggested CT was suggested of grade four COVID pneumonia. She was not vaccinated prior to this illness. Uh, her tacro MMF was stopped, and tacrolimus dose was reduced by 50 percent, and she received injection remdesivir, dexamethasone, and enoxaparin. Her admission rate was five, and discharge rate was 1.6. Two years, six months post-transplant. Digestion was removed and the uh, exchange was planned, but it could not be done at that time. Her uh, serum creatinine was at that time was one point eight, and uh, as following this, patient was on irregular follow up and she had multiple proxy visit and she just uh, got drugs with the multiple proxy visit. And three years, seven months post transplant, uh, that is one and a uh, one year, one month uh, after this incident, patient came with a history of nocturia for ten days. 
and pain in the right iliac fossa. This time she had no fever or dysuria. Her admission serum creates NOS 5. The serum uh, CTKB showed a presence of obstruction. Hence, she was planned for balloon dilatation. Cystoscopy, and, uh, cystoscopy was done, balloon dilatation was done, and digestant insertion was done. Her creatinine has come down from 5 to 4. However, one month later, that is three years, eight months post transplant, patient was admitted with complaints of vomiting, swelling of legs, and excessive breathlessness. She had no fever, dysuria, or oliguria. Patient denies any drug non complaints. Her admission created NOS 5. Tacro C0 level was 5.2. USG KB done showed no evidence of obstruction. Urine culture was negative. And transplant re was done, which was normal. And uh, allograft biopsy was done, and she was told to have she had a rejection with some chronic changes. Uh, coming to past history, there was no significant past history, no history of uh, diabetes mellitus or hypothyroid, uh, asthma, COPD, or seizure disorder. Personal history, she consumes mixed diet, non smoker, al alcoholic, non alcoholic, and ob obstetric history, uh, uh, para 2, light 2, A1. In first pregnancy, it was a full term normal vaginal delivery. There was no gestation diabetes or just like hypertension or proteinuria at that time. Second pregnancy, uh, patient told that it was unplanned pregnancy and it was induced. Uh, induced abortion was done. Third pregnancy, there was premature rupture of membrane at 35 weeks. At that time, she was found to have uh, hypertension. However, she says that uh, she was taken up for emergency LSES. Baby was fine. Uh, she was uh, Baby was in NICU for two days and uh, it, uh, uh, baby got well. And systemic hypertension dissolved post-delivery for the patient. So coming to summary, a 47 year old lady with uh, in 2014, uh, patient presented with proteinuria, hypertension and renal failure and which progressed on to ESA, ESRD state in three, uh, three years, warranting a maintenance hemodialysis of two by seven. And one year later in July, 2018, patient underwent ABO compatible live related renal transplantation with spouse donor. And it was, there was low graft function. Three months post-transplant, patient developed asymptomatic bacteria. Seven months post-transplant, patient developed proper, uh, antibody mediated rejection. Ten months post-transplant, patient developed CMV syndrome, along with ureteral structure for which DJ stenting insertion was done. And one year, seven months post-transplant, patient developed acute graft dysfunction following uh, obstructive nephropathy, secondary to DJ stent removal, which was dialysis requiring, and she was again uh, inserted. DJ stent insertion was done again. Two year, four months post transplant, patient had a grade four COVID pneumonia. And two years, six months post transplant, digestant was removed, but exchange was not possible. And the patient lost to follow up. And three years, seven months post transplant, patient again presented with obstructive nephropathy with chronic heart dysfunction. Uh, but, uh, uh, cystoscopy followed by balloon dilatation with digestating insertion was done. And uh, three year, eight months post transplant, now she presented with acute and chronic heart dysfunction. Shall I proceed, sir? Uh, what's alien? That is a uh, fairly a good presentation. Uh, can you just uh, give a diagnosis? You would like to give a diagnosis first and then enlist the problems worthy of discussion. Okay, sir. What is the current diagnosis? Current uh, diagnosis is uh, chronic graft dysfunction, sir. Uh, stage 5 TD, sir. Chronic graft dysfunction? Stage 5, sir. Uh, I didn't till present the... There was further clinical uh, features, sir. Actually, see... She was dialysis requiring for the next one month. Yeah, please, yeah, please mention that one. You complete. And in the general coming to general examination, uh, patient was no no. No, 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 no. What I said is that we'll go to the examination later. Okay, sir. But at the end of your clinical uh, history, what is your diagnosis? And enlist the problems which she has gone through. Come out with your diagnosis. Okay. Actually, following this, uh, uh, patient uh, uh, underwent biopsy and she was told to have chronic rejection and she didn't need any uh, optimization, didn't need any aggressive immune suppression. And the patient was uh, actually uh, initiated on hemodialysis. However, her uh, urine output started deteriorating and the graft uh, dysfunction persisted uh, for the next one month. So, hence, she was dialysis requiring and she was on uh, maintenance hemodialysis weekly twice. So, in two years, nine months post transplant, she was found to be chronic graft dysfunction, uh, CKD stage 5 TDC. And I would like to enlist the symptoms as uh, I enlist the clinical features as post transplant features, uh, three months. Shall I say it again? Yes, yes. Go on, go on. You enlist the problems in this patient right now. Ah, yes. 
3 months post transplant asymptomatic bacteria 7 months post transplant acute antibody mediated uh, antibody mediated acute antibody mediated resection uh, 10 months post transplant cmb syndrome with urethral sir 1 year 7 month post transplant uh, acute blood dysfunction with obstructive nephropathy 2 year 4 month post transplant grade 4 covid pneumonia uh, 3 year 7 months post transplant obstructive nephropathy and 3 year 8 months post transplant she presented with acute and chronic graft dysfunction uh, uh, and in a 3 year 9 months post transplant she was found to have chronic graft dysfunction straight away what do you, what do you think is a native kidney disease in this patient sir actually native kidney disease is uh, not known so probably chronic glomerular nephritis sir she didn't have any features of connective tissue disorders or uh, any uh, uh, chronic other pathology sir i would like to uh, say uh, probably it may be due to ign nephropathy now let's see some strong uh, close to that don't commit on a on a histological diagnosis without really knowing the histology okay. how will you define ckdu ckdu uh, actually th- there will be a presence of uh, 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 chronic kidney disease sir with no identifiable etiologies like uh, diabetes uh, diabetes hypertension can be present sir but uh, in hypertension it should be controlled with a single anti hypertensive drugs and uh, the epidemiological features may suggest uh, uh, it usually occurs in agrochemical uh, farmers who works in agrochemical region or in tropical countries with uh, increased uh, no, but all that is not there in the criteria you look at the criteria what will you see so you can't to make out uh, i understand we you find it in clusters then it is fine but here and there you find some isolated patients isn't it so what will be a criteria to say it's ckd any criteria has been defined by somebody working in this area okay i suggest that you look into this okay right so you think this is a chronic uh, glomerular nephritis okay so what uh, ckd would uh, progress to uh, esrd in about 3 years time? because when you diagnosed ckd it was 2014 in 2017 she went into dialysis so what are the what are the glomerular diseases that can rapidly progress like this thrombotic microangiopathy can uh, lead on to ckd sir in this in this patient in order of priority whenever you put up some something always say it in terms of priority okay there was nothing to suggest tma in this patient at all is it so what are the, what are the uh, possible etiologies that could progress this fast i would like to offer differential diagnosis sir yeah that's what i mean first i would like to offer tma sir thrombotic microangiopathy uh, that is what i'm asking you when you say differential diagnosis it should be in order of priority you can also say c3 gn in this patient yes. isn't it so in order of priority what is the common glomerular disease that you see that you initially try to commit ign nephropathy ign nephropathy. So nephropathy can progress like this okay any any other disease of course tma i am not saying no but just try to put it in uh, in priority in order of priority tma could be there uh, you know it could be a c3 gn anything else she has no other features lupus nephritis can occur sir but uh, she is not having any extra Fine, reaction. nothing to nothing to really suggest lupus nephritis could it be some tubular interstitial disease tubular interstitial disease uh, usually adpkd can occur but uh, there's no family history in this patient sir right then what is some dominant tubular interstitial disease ad ad dkd yes okay again no uh, other glomerular disease that one has to keep in mind is fsgs suppose which could progress so in order of priority would be iga fsgs tma possible uh, cause of end stage kidney disease so this patient had a spousal donor yes correct so when you are considering the spouses donor what are the various aspects you can you will take into consideration before working up this spousal donor uh, spousal donor particularly uh, a female uh, wife uh, getting a 
a kidney from husband there is a, actually spousal donor they are not uh, related sir they are, hence they are not related uh, biologically unrelated and biologically unrelated so there is an yeah. increased risk of uh, sensitization in this patient sir because uh, there was two pr prior episodes uh, three times pregnancy three pregnancies so right might, might have been sensitive so you see if uh, comes under the high risk uh, category sir high immunological risk what so, is the definition of a complex living donor Whom do you call as complex living donor? Somebody over the age of sixty, having hypertension. They have got extended criteria. Yeah, but this complex living donor is a term that has been specifically looked into. So please look into it. Okay, right. So this patient had a slow graft function, and the discharge creatinine was two point eight. Yes. The the best creatinine came almost a month later to one point three. So what was the reason for this slow graft function? Please, he says that their uh, surgery has been prolonged, sir. So there was some vascular procedure done. So probably there had been an increase in warm ischemia. Cold is uh, warm ischemia time may be increased, sir. So that might have been lead to. Uh, you think the warm ischemia time would be prolonged, or a cold ischemia time would have been? Usually, ah, uh, cold ischemia time. Sir. Cold ischemia. No. Time. Okay, so what is the uh, normal warm ischemia time in a in a related transplant? In live uh, live transplant, it will be uh, it will be around three to five minutes. Three five minutes, sir. Five minutes is actually too long. Uh, it should be shorter than that. Perfect, right. Okay. So it is possible that uh, there was a prolonged cold ischemia time. Anything else? Any other cause for slow graft function? In this patient, not not. Yes, Not in this patient. Generally, I'm asking. Generally, if the donor is uh, found to have increase in age, sir, increase age, or donor has any hypertension, mm. or any there is perioperative in cells such as hypotension before organ uh, procurement, and in recipient factor, if there is uh, associated diabetes mellitus, or there is uh, any obesity in the recipient, uh, this can uh, lead on to chronic. Uh, well, why should di diabetes and uh, obesity cause slow graft function? Long the cold ischemia time is fine, right? Hypotension, uh, hemodynamic compromise, either in the donor or in the recipient is fine. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? Suppose uh, somebody has a good urine output, immediate good graft function. Two three days later, they get into an oliguria and get into worsening graft. This function. What do you call that situation? Etiology of that. Etiology. Mm. Somebody has good immediate graft function. Let's say one or two days of good urine output. Then there's a slow decline in urine output, and then again it starts picking up after third or fifth day. Have you heard of ischemia reperfusion injury? Yeah, ischemia reperfusion. Ah, so. It's possible that uh, she had some ischemia reperfusion injury. Okay. The other things, of course, could be drug toxicity, acute interstitial nephritis caused by some antibiotic, or ATN caused by uh, tacrolimus, or one of the CNIs that that is used. Uh, though not common, graft pyelonephritis should also be kept in mind. <clears throat> These are the causes for slow graft function that prolongs. And of course, uh, the patient uh, uh, had a best creatinine of 1.3 uh, at discharge. Okay. Then, then you mentioned about asymptomatic bacteriuria. Yes. So, what are the what are the measures that you can take to prevent this uh, UTI in transplant recipients? Uh, female sex is more prone for uh, asymptomatic bacteria, so so we should uh, advise them regarding perineal hygiene. Sir. Then we should start on a septron prophylaxis post transplant. It decreases the incidence of uh, co-trimoxazole. Co don't use uh, don't use pharmacological. Use only pharmacological names. Mm. Then uh, we should okay. add, uh, decrease the instrumentation. Sir, we should uh, remove the Foley's catheter at the earliest, and we should uh, remove a digestant as, as early as possible. Sir. Right. Over. Did this patient have a stent? No, sir. No stent. No stent. No. Right. Fine. So, what are the other advantages of using co-trimoxazole prophylaxis? It decreases the incidence of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, sir. Zero is pneumonia. Decreases the incidence of toxoplasmosis. Nocardia also decreases. Right. 
So at the seventh month, uh, this patient had an acute graft dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So what the differential diagnosis would you consider? So I will consider first, uh, first uh, acute rejection, sir. Then second, I would consider CNA toxicity. Uh, third, I would consider any infection such as uh, CMB or uh, cytomegalovirus or BK virus nephropathy, sir. And the fourth, I would consider any recurrence of uh, glomerulonephritis. Okay. So, in order of priority, this is what you would consider. Okay. Yes. So, this patient had uh, induction therapy? She told that she received induction therapy, sir, but she was not aware of the names. Right. right. So, uh, if this patient had an acute graft dysfunction, these are the differential diagnoses you would consider. So, how would you go about evaluating an acute graft dysfunction? So, acute graft dysfunction, first I will uh, roll out uh, uh, ultrasound uh, abdomen uh, KB to roll out any obstruction is there. Okay. Right. I'd like to do renal artery doublet to roll out any renal artery stenosis or thrombosis. Uh, okay. Then I would like to do... Uh, how, does a, how does a transplant renal artery stenosis generally present? Transplant renal artery stenosis, it presents in early post-operative phase in a sudden uh, on a painless uh, anuria, sir. It suddenly leads on to anuria. Sir. Renal artery no, thrombosis. That is graft artery thrombosis. I'm asking about... You mentioned about renal artery stenosis. Stenosis. Sir, uh, uh, phenosis, there will be usually the patient will have difficult to control hypertension. Sir. So, the requirement of antihypertensive will increase and the patient will slowly tend to have fluid retention and uh, uh, other associated features. Sir. Patient will develop uh, hypokalemia. And, uh, so, you, uh, you, have heard about, you heard about uh, Pickering syndrome? Pickering syndrome. Yes, where sir. they develop a flash pulmonary. Yes, yeah. So, that could be the presentations. Okay, right. So, how would, you, how would you go? But you would do a Doppler, then what else would you do? Then I would uh, do actually, I, I would like to do rule out infection, sir. Urine culture sensitivity, I would like to rule out. Right. Then I will uh, proceed with biopsy, sir. Allograph. Would you uh, consider doing a CNI uh, trough level also? Yes, CNI trough level, yes. CNI level. Right. So, that could be, you since you considered CNI toxicity, yes. and a low CNI level could also give you a clue that it is an infection. Was there any non-compliance on the part of the patient? No, sir. Patient denies any non-compliance of the patient. Right. Okay. So, this patient had a creatinine of 2.5 and after your flex sessions and uh, IVIG, the lowest creatinine, the best creatinine after that was only 2.1. Yes. So, when you when you treat an ABMR, what, what is your aim of treatment? What is your goal that you're looking at? Actually, uh, if, we, if there is a association, if we can measure DSA, we should uh, find the disappearance of DSA. Sir. Right. If DSA so here is you not, have not done DSA. Yes, okay. we are not done DSA. Uh, right. other, then we can uh, look for creatinine, sir. At least 50% uh, decrease in serum creatinine from the peak. We can. Right, right. So in this patient, the creatinine came down from 2.5 to 2.1. Yes. <clears throat> and after that, uh, it reduced, it did reduce after sir, quite some time, not immediately. Yes, sir. So this patient had a CMV PCR done for what? At 10 months, diarrhea. Uh, she presented <clears throat> fever, myalgia. So we are suspecting CMV syndrome, sir, because she also received uh, she received valgan prophylaxis uh, post uh, this uh, plex and IVIG session, sir. She received for three months and the following mm -hmm. three months we received. So we have suspected uh, since there was increase in immunosuppression, mm -hmm. we can so <clears throat> a CMV PCR. So, when, when is the CMV PCR likely to be negative in the presence of CMV? If there is compartmentalization involving GI uh, involvement or a retinitis, it will be usually negative, sir. Tissue invasive CMV, yes. yes. Tissue invasive CMV, sir. Right. Okay, fine. So, how does CMV uh, of the graft present? So, uh, in the graft, it can present with uh, increase in serum creatinine, sir. Actually, uh, worsening graft function. Graft function. Oh. Then it can uh, actually it has immunomodulatory properties. It can even increase the risk of rejection, right. and, uh, increase the risk of uh, more viral infections uh, such as HSV, uh, varicella zoster, and even uh, EBV. It can increase the risk of infection. Yeah, it can also produce collapsing glomerulopathy yes, can. <coughs> and can present as a proteinuria. Yes. Right. Gopal, you can take over. Um, okay, fine. Thank you. Fine. Um, Batsalian. Uh, you did uh, mention about something very interesting about the opposite history. The, during third pregnancy, what are the abnormalities she noted? She, actually, she had a premature rupture of membrane, sir. Uh, till, okay. that, till that, she didn't have any BP, uh, hypertension or proteinuria, sir. 
uh, only at that time she it was found to have hypertension what do you call that somebody developing hypertension towards uh, i mean uh, third trimester or around delivery without without any documented elevated bp in the past a pregnancy induced can it be pre eclampsia yeah? no sir there was no proteinuria sir i would like to proteinuria is my, it's not mandatory and it's not mandatory sir it's not mandatory Any hypertension occurring in the third trimester after the vibratory uh, fetus uh, it is pre eclampsia yeah? so is it not uh, unusual for somebody to develop a pre eclampsia yeah, during third pregnancy yes usually with the, with the same paternity paternity is same if the paternity is different that is understandable so the same paternity third pregnancy somebody developing pre eclampsia what does it indicate and this lady after some time goes in for hypertension proteinuria ckd probably there can be an underlying a smoldering kidney injury might have been happening or there is at least a vulnerability so this point this history is i thought very important otherwise you know it's unusual for somebody uh, to develop uh, hypertension that is a preeclampsia pregnancy induced hypertension during third trimester is it not and according to you that the, the blood pressure subsided soon after but only thing you know like uh, very often this mistake happens on the part of the obstetricians and physicians in the sense that even if there is an apparent drop in the blood pressure after pregnancy they should be mandated to undergo a periodic check up of blood pressure the whole thing could have been delayed so that window of opportunity i think we have lost so at least there is a vulnerability for her to develop some kidney disease or there is something smoldering over there so that is number one. that point i think i uh, i thought i'll discuss that fine um then you said uh, what are the vaccinations she, she received actually she received only uh, hepatitis b vaccinations so four doses what are other vaccines that have to be administered see uh, influenza a vaccine should be given yearly sir hmm. and uh, uh, pneumococcal vaccination should be given sir pcv 13 followed by 6 to 8 weeks later uh, pp uh, uh, polysaccharide vaccine should be given uh, then it should be given after 5 years any other vaccine covid vaccination should be given sir fine right. now covid varicella varicella yes sir prior to transplant varicella should be given sir so now we have uh, it has become a routine practice like we give all that is it so the vaccination history uh, that you have done okay fine uh, and he she developed uh, uti and that short klebsiella is this yes. not yes and what is the sensitivity pattern do you find any aberration in that uh, report klebsiella sensitive to nitroferrin toy yes yeah like i'm like will you will you give nitroferrin toy for treatment of uh, klebsiella infection also awesome. Yeah, interferon toin uh, cannot be given when there is a klebsiella, and similarly, interferon toin cannot be given even if the patterns so shows the antibiograms shows sensitivity if it involves the upper part of the urinary tract like pyelonephritis. Yes. So that's it, and then acute graft dysfunction, and you surmised it is ABMR. That's what you said, is it not? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, based on the history suggestive of plasma paresis, you surmised that it was ABMR. Yes, in yes, what are the situation post transplant you uh, venture with plasma paresis there is recurrent tma or recurrent fsgs uh, we can proceed with uh, plasma paresis yeah these are the two other indications fine so here it was fairly uh, good uh, what is the current understanding of uh, treatment of uh, as uh, professor edwin pointed out you know there was no significant response to your plasma paresis therapy is it not yes. is it only plasma paresis or something club along with that along with iv ags sir IV. what are the dose ivg actually 100 to 2 min 200 mg per kg after every plasma sessions and after the last uh, pl plasma session 2 g per kg can be given instead of this instead of uh, giving it uh, every session it can be given okay fine so is there any very robust evidence to show that this combination of plasma paresis and ivg is really really working in abmr no sir there is no robust evidence quite true fine so what is your understanding in what situation it really helps and in what situation it does not help much uh, actually what are the determinants of the outcome of this particular therapy in abmr so abmr and pl uh, plasma paresis and ivg treatment is uh, mainly used if there a patient develops a, 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 a abmr due to uh, preformed uh, dss and that to in the immediate post uh, 
post transplant period it is in the early abmr less than 30 days uh, it will be very useful sir at that time quite true there are two important things that determine the uh, outcome of this therapy it is very effective if it happens in less than 30 days number one and number two pre existing oh. dsa it is not very effective on de novo de novo dsa, DSA fresh development so this is a well known factor so here it happened about uh, seven months yeah seven months so it's relatively a late ebmr So you said CMB syndrome. What do you mean by that? CMB syndrome is a it's a constellation of features like fever, malaise, uh, di diarrhea, and there can be transaminitis can be associated with it. There is no specific end organ damage in CMB syndrome, sir. There is end organ specific damage, then we should say it as CMB disease, like involving gastrointestinal tract, hepatitis. Pancreatitis, uh, pneumonitis, nephritis. Right. So what are the risk factors? Why she developed uh, this CMB disease? Probably in her it can be due to uh, in, in high cup in immunosuppression. Sir. She received treatment for ABMR and she uh, she was also treated with rituximab and possibly uh, bortezomipa. So uh, how do you treat uh, CMB? So CMB will uh, treat with, uh, we should uh, look whether it is mild, moderate or severe, sir. If the patient is severe and critically ill, we should treat with IV ganciclovir, sir. Uh, 5 mg per kg BD. If the uh, patient falls in uh, mild to moderate category, uh, if there is no critically ill, then we can treat with uh, valgan ganciclovir, 900, 900 mg BD, sir. We should uh, treat till, uh, we should treat for minimum of at least two weeks and the patient should be free of symptoms and uh, two consecutive uh, CMV PCR should be negative, sir. Till that we should treat. So how do you define CMV resistant I mean, treatment resistant or refractory CMB disease. Usually, uh, after treatment, within two weeks, the CMB PCR quantitative should fall by one log reduction, sir. If there is less than one log reduction or if there is no decrease, we will uh, treat it as CMB, refractory CMB, CMB disease. So, there are not many therapeutic options for uh, uh, refractory CMB disease. So, it's a problem. And so, you think... Uh, the anti-rejection therapy and all might have been a risk factor. Yes, yes. So yet another infection you suspected in her, which is a complication of this. Yes, the high up immunosuppressive therapy, what is that? DK virus. No. Yeah. Why did you think uh, in terms uh, of I think Dr. Gopal, we would like to ask some student the yeah. question what you asked. If this patient has not, I am not sure whether the CMV, DNAs or PCR became negative after treatment. Yes, sir, it became negative after treatment, sir. but she was done only qualitative, sir, not quantitative, sir. Qualitative. Yes. Now, if the person does not respond to this treatment, what are the options you have got? I would like to give... You have, you have defined CMB resistance, uh, that if there is no drop in the CMB titers by at least one log, yes. and you have given adequate treatment for a duration of two to four weeks, whatever time, and it has not responded. What is the alternative? IV foscarnet and IV sidofovir can be tried. Sir. Will you like to give sidofovir in this patient? In this patient, oh, you have got both the drugs. But, but in this patient, there is nephrotoxicity, sir. So I would. So you will avoid it. Avoid it. Sir. Because the third option can be increase I... the dose of uh, well gancyclovir yes. or whatever gancyclovir you are giving, because that is another option. So the options with you are either increase the dose. Number two, you can give foscarnet. And third, you said pseudofit. So whichever, if a person is resistant, and how often a person is resistant to this treatment? Because here, whatever you are getting, the problems, they are all related to ureteral, ureteral stricture. Every time... The stent is removed, he comes with obstruction. You again remove it, again he comes with obstruction. So logically you feel the stent should not have been removed in this patient. Or it, has, it should be changed adequately. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead for that. What do you think is the cause for uretic stricture? What are the differential diagnosis? So differential diagnosis, uh, uh, first it can be due to BK virus nephropathy, sir. And the second, even in a severe form of uh, acute rejection, there can be ureteral stricture, uh, ureteral stenosis uh, can occur, sir. In a, if it is due to, in early post-transplant period, it can be due to ischemia, sir. Ischemia leading on to ureteral stenosis. So, in 
ischemia and abmr you get more of erythrolysis rather than stricture so so there can be a mechanical obstruction at the neocystoid erythrostomy that is one thing possible and is it can tuberculosis present as stricture yes. yeah tuberculosis can present as stricture fine so why you thought bk virus is more likely here because there was a recent hike up in immunosuppression sir and it is in early post transplant period there is high vulnerability for bk virus infection okay. so if you think in terms of bk virus so how do you proceed what investigations you carry on since we have done an allograft biopsy no no what are the investigations you do for bk virus so i will i would like to do urine uh, urine analysis to look for a decoy cell sir okay then i would like to do urine uh, bkv pcr uh, quantitative assay sir and uh, serum qu bkv quantitative assay sir fine and if you have done an allograft biopsy i would like to do sv40 staining in that okay. biopsy so the uh, do you remember the cut off values uh, as recommended by kdgo guidelines yes, sir urine pcr urine value plasma and urine in uh, urine pcr more than 10 power 7 and uh, serum uh, in a serum pcr more than of 10 power 4 is associated with high chance of bk virus necrosis you said something as decoy cell what is that in the urine actually decoy cell is the uh, reticular endothelial cells which has uh, like slight renal tubular epithelial cell tubular epithelial rtc uh, re renal tubular epithelial cells actually uh, by staining with papaniclosmere it it will appear to have slightly enlarged nucleus with ground glass opacities with the intranuclear viral inclusions okay uh, a slight deviation from the clinical course what are the other uh, methods or what are the other ways bk virus present itself so bk virus can present as hemorrhagic cystitis sir it usually occurs in hemopoietic stem cell transplant and it can uh, pre present as small ring uh, as creeping creatinine slow rise in creatinine it can present okay so how do you treat if you diagnose uh, bk virus how do you treat it if you have diagnosed a bk virus we should uh, uh, decrease the immunosuppression sir first i would like to decrease the anti metabolite dose by 50% sir and i would like to uh, look at the response usually by 4 weeks uh, there should be 0.3 log reduction in bk virus uh, pcr level sir if there is no further reduction i would like to stop the anti metabolite and i would like to continue cni with prednisolone and if there is still no response i would like to decrease cni by 25% and we should gradually look sir slow there should be very slow decrease in uh, immunosuppression okay so in her the actual cause for the dilated system was not really known is it not? yes sir. but there was improvement in the graft function after stenting is it yes, yes yes sir that's fine um then you said that she developed uh, covid pneumonia yes so what are the impact of covid on graft function what all ways a transplant kidney transplant recipient is afflicted with covid so the transplant patient can develop acute tract dysfunction sir it can be due to acute tubular injury secondary to cytokine storm or there can be hypovolemia due to hypotension or hypoxemia or then can be rhabdomyolysis associated with ate sir it can occur and there is even a hypothesis that there is direct viral injury invasion of the tubular cells it can cause ati uh, it can then it can cause endotheliitis it can cause microthrombi in the glomeruli and there there can there are even anecdotal reports of tma and collapsing glomerulopathy in uh, uh, covid covid sir then it can uh, actually in transplant there can uh, there will be reduction in immunosuppression so there have been anecdotal reports that there can be dsa can be elevated in some patients and even there can there there can be a uh, precipitation of uh, graft rejection once the patient recovers and uh, there has been a, there has been case reports regarding a graft artery thrombosis also sir. so graft yeah, there is a, there is the most dreaded complication you know there are reports of graft arterial thrombosis because covid is a thrombophilic condition okay. so how do you what is uh, the protocol of immunosuppressive therapy modulation so in i will face of covid i would look at the clinical symptoms sir whether it is mild moderate or severe in mild i would i would not like to uh, reduce the immunosuppression sir in moderate i would like to reduce the uh, immunosuppression uh, anti metabolites by 50% and i would like to give injection remdesivir and uh, injection uh, low molecular weight heparin and uh, dexamethasone sir if if the if there is severe covid infection then i would like to stop the anti metabolites and even if there is necessity to stop cna i will stop cna after uh, uh, watching 
and i would like to give caparin dexa and remdesivir sir so in the presence of renal failure how do you give remdesivir uh, in the presence of uh, renal failure if the egfr is less than 30 i would uh, i will give the loading dose of remdesivir 200 mg followed by 100 mg uh, in alternate days, IVOD on alternate days. Oh, fine. But uh, has remdesivir been shown to be of definite value in COVID? No, sir. So at the maximum, it has delayed the hospitalization rate and so on. No? So we don't have robust evidence. Okay. So is it likely that the, because of reduction in the immunosuppression, the risk of rejection is increased in COVID, post-COVID. Yes, sir. Actually, there has been a slight increase in the rate of rejection. That's right. Okay. So, then what happened? Again, she developed worsening of the graft function. Yes. Okay. And uh, biopsy was done, you said. Yes. Graft biopsy was done. Done, yes, sir. And what was she told about the biopsy? She was told to have, she have a rejection with the features of chronic changes and she wouldn't benefit much of immunosuppression therapy since she was, and her target level was maintained in normal range and she was advised to continue the same immunosuppression. Fine. So what do you think is uh, likely in the graft biopsy based on this description? I would like to consider chronic uh, ABMR, sir. So probably it is chronic ABMR. Oh, probably, probably, sir. Can you just quickly recapitulate the, the hero findings in acute ABMR and chronic ABMR in graft. Uh, in uh, acute ABMR, there will be the first. There will be histological evidence of injury. That is either uh, glomerulitis or peritubular capillaritis, and there and there can be uh, arteritis. Sir, intimal arteritis can be there, along with presence of TMA. With there is no identifiable cause or uh, acute tubular injury in absence of any other cause. Then there should be uh, uh, interaction of the there should be evidence of interaction of antibody with the endothelium. Sir. So linear C4D staining in the peritubular capillary, capillaries or there is increased expression of uh, gene transcripts related with uh, rejection. Sir. So uh, that facility is not there with us. Not there, so yes. It is C4D then, staining. C4D staining. Okay. Then uh, there should be evidence of DS. What is the importance of this C4D? What does it tell you? C4D uh, says that there is uh, activation of the classical complement pathway and the C4D has been non-covalently bound to the endothelium. Covalently bound or non-covalently? Covalently, covalently bound. bound. So why not C3? Why don't you look up the other components of complement? Sir, other components has been, uh, have been eff effectively degraded by the uh, enzyme systems in the glomerulus and the... But only in a peritubular it is... Uh, so because it is covalently bound. You know, basically very strong the bonding, you know, binding. So it is it resists the degradation mechanisms. So that is how it serves as a footprint of evidence for complement activation. Is it not? Yeah, there is so much on C4D nowadays. Okay, fine. So uh, can you just uh, project the, the histopathology slide of the graft biopsy that, is, uh, that was done just before she was initiated into maintenance hemodialysis? Uh, this is the renal biopsies. Go to the next slide. Next slide. Yes, sir, this is two slides. Yeah. So can you just describe what is this one? Uh, in the left, there is uh, actually, it's a silver stain, which shows a uh, duplication of the glomerular basement membrane in the arrow cell. So there is evidence of uh, chronic, uh, chronic uh, development of the glomerular we can't see. We can't see the slide, actually. Have you share, shared this screen? Uh, I'm able to see. I'm able to see. Uh, okay. I will share it one, one more time, sir. Ah. Is it visible, sir? Now, ah, yes, yeah, yes. it's visible. Yeah. You you only describe the the projection on the left hand side with the silver stain. Yes, sir. In the right hand side, there is actually there there, there is perit evidence of peritubular capillary cell. As it can be seen here, there are WBCs, mononuclear cells, which is infiltrating the peritubular capillary cell. Here, here. Fine. On the left hand side. Uh, left hand side, there is a. Uh, duplication of the glomerular basement membrane, sir. And capillary loops are open. Open, sir. Capillary loops are open. There is no glomerulitis here. Yes. In this, what do you call this? You know, the thickening of the uh, capillary wall and duplication and the double contouring in the yes. transplant uh, biopsy. What do you call this? Transplant glomerulopathy. 
transplant glomerulopathy it is a reflection of a chronic process or an active process chronic process yeah so in a chronic if it is a pure chronic abmr what else you would be looking for beyond this uh, transplant glomerulopathy in a peritubular capillary we can uh, look for uh, peritubular capillary based from brain multi layering sir it's an multi layering multi layering of the peritubular capillary fine and of course ifta is it no yes, and now the present concept is the most common cause for ifta in a transplant biopsy is chronic t cell mediated chronic abmr in the past we were thinking it is chronic cyclosporine toxicity but now you know the, the most common cause for ifta in the graft biopsy is chronic abmr right okay so there is uh, what is the final impression of this allograft biopsy on the one side it is a transplant glomerulopathy on the other side you said it's a peritubular capillaritis so what is your impression probably chronic abmr sir so is the peritubular capillaritis is a feature of chronic no sir just now you said it's a peritubular capillary multi layering yes. and transplant glomerulopathy yes. so i don't deny there is chronicity certainly there is chronicity but also there is acute insulin. acute component yeah. acute component there's a mixture that's what's happening okay and is what is the specific therapeutic maneuvering that can be attempted in chronic abmr do you go ahead with the plasmapheresis in chronic abmr no sir since there is limited load i i like uh, now there are emerging evidence of il6 blockade in uh, chronic abmr sir say it again uh, il6 interleukin, interleukin 6, 6 blockade okay blockade. what is that can you elaborate on that uh, actually uh, il6 along with uh, tgf beta it uh, stimulates the uh, interleukin and uh, the t helper cell 17 sir normally the uh, conversion of the b cell to plasma cell is facilitated by the t helper cell and il6 plays a primordial role in conversion of the uh, uh, plasma cell to the uh, immature b cells to the plasma cell sir. so okay, what is the agent can you say, say some agents il6 uh, uh, il6 okay. il6 is uh, il6 receptor antagonist is uh, tocilizumab sir okay. and it has been tried in case reports and il6 receptor il6 blockade uh, il6 antagonist it's by clazaxizumab clazaxizumab okay so i would uh, i would encourage all the uh, those graduates who are attending this program please go through the the commentary and the original article appeared which has appeared recent the kir yeah. okay so can you uh, name any trial which is ongoing uh, now is il6 blockade in chronic abmr because chronic abmr is a burning issue in the transplant scenario it is emerging as the single most important cause for chronic allograft failure as of now we don't have any specific therapeutic measures beyond optimization of immunosuppression so there is a lot of hopes that are pinned on this particular uh, maneuvering namely il6 blockade can you name the trial imagine ongoing imagine trials sir imagine, imagine. Right. And, and how often you are giving il6 in a bit actually actually so they have given week uh, monthly injection sir yeah every uh, month so and and classics is also Dr. jordan and group is working on that also that every month they are giving il6 tocilizumab and yeah go ahead and clazacizumab it is also trial months, two injections they have given 25 mg subcutaneous okay. fine you said this patient probably received rituximab what's your comment on the role of rituximab in abmr there has been no strong evidence of uh, rituximab in abmr sir it can be tried uh, particularly in uh, preformed dsa it, it has been shown that if there is very high dsa titer it has shown to decrease sir uh, particularly in high dsa 375 no. mg yes you are right actually there are so far in the published literature there are only three small rcts yes. and none of them are a positive trial they are all negatives right yes. any any other measure any other agent that is tried in abmr Uh, yeah, bortezomib injection has been tried, sir. What is bortezomib? Bortezomib is a specific proteasome inhibitor, sir. Okay. Uh, it specifically inhibits the plasma cell, and uh, it can lead on to plasma cell deple depletion, sir. And uh, any any named trial based on bortezomib in ABMR? Uh, the bortezomib there is a trial, sir. In uh, late uh, ABMR, it has been tried with median uh, transplant duration of five years. They have given uh, bortezomib. However, there is no improvement in uh, graft function uh, or uh, uh, graft function or patient. That there is no improvement at two years. 
However, there is increased risk of side effects with cortisol, particularly anemia, thrombocytopenia, and there is GA intolerance. And there is also increased incidence of peripheral neuropathy. Is there any other role for anti-complement therapy like equilizumab? Equilizumab can be given, uh, as I mentioned, in early, early ABMR with preformed uh, DSA, it can be tried, sir. In, uh, in only in that condition, it has a major role, sir, less than 30 days. And uh, Professor Edwin rightly asked one question. Have you ensured non-adherence? Is it a real problem in India? Yes, it is a real problem. Sir. So can you just quote our study we have done on non-adherence? What is the prevalence of non-adherence to immunosuppression in our population? It's 25%. Sir. Ah, 28%. So that is a major issue. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Professor Verma, please you take over, sir. Uh, one question, mm -hmm. because you have uh, given the answer to most of the things. Uh, one is, uh, should asymptomatic bacteria, as you mentioned, should it be treated? So there has been, uh, uh, actually, they have adv advised for treatment only in less than three months, sir. Initial three months post-transplant, it can be given that, that only for a short duration, sir, about seven days. That, that, that's, a, that's not a very firm guideline. No, that's not a firm guideline, yes. Yeah. In which settings of asymptomatic bacteria you want to treat? Leave aside transplant. Okay. In which other settings, if a patient has got asymptomatic pregnancy, bacteria? Pregnancy, sir. Pregnancy. That is one. And that, secondly, uh, if you are doing any manipulation of genital urinary system, yes. And if a person has these are the two. Third, what you mentioned, possibly many nephrologists like to treat in the early times, in the early months, one or two months, that if a person has got asymptomatic bacteria. You have already mentioned how to manage a patient of ABMR because, uh, as you said, there are no fixed guidelines or principles. What is uh, a opinion of people? And that is basically IVIG and Plex. They are the recommended things. And as you mentioned, that rituximab or bortezomib have been tried, but they do not have any solid role. About the chronic ABMR, as you mentioned, that possibly the, as Professor Gopal was mentioning, that it is the adjustment of immunosuppression that is the most important. And uh, if now the new emerging role of IL-6 blockers is coming up, uh, what is your comment on C4D positive or C4D negative rejection? I'll take the opinion of um, the examiners, please. So, can you tell some situation where C4D can be negative in the presence of ABM? Uh, you, know, you are having C because C4D is not an um, uh, imperative criteria for diagnosis of ABMR now. Typical thing you have got DSA and AB, let's say C4D is negative. Do they behave? I'm, I'm not sure. Do they behave? First, we will put it to the student today. Do they behave equally good or bad? A person is C4D positive rejection, other is C4D negative. Uh, C4D positive re rejection occurs due to DSA, which has a uh, uh, complement dependent cytotoxicity. But in uh, other uh, types of uh, involvement, like uh, antibody dependent cytotoxicity and direct uh, DSA uh, stimulating the endothelial cell. In this condition, C4D will be negative. And C4D negative ABMR has been uh, linked with uh, increased incidence of chronic rejections and the le le less response to treatment. Has been Professor Sakuja wanted to say something. Uh, just a couple of comments uh, and questions. One is, uh, although obstruction of the ureter did not lead to the graft loss because we have the biopsy findings showing transplant glomerulopathy and uh, uh, peritubular uh, capillaritis. So, but uh, this is not a common complication. So what was the cause of this and why was it not uh, um, more aggressively investigated right uh, from the start and nothing done about it for a long time except stenting? That's what uh, struck me as uh, unusual. This is, in any case, not a common complication. 
yes sir uh, i shall i answer this question actually we were uh, sure. we were at, uh, at loss to understand what was the cause for this uh, dilated system uh, yes, yes so initially we thought it is bk virus so we extensively uh, worked upon that and nothing was evident and uh, in initial early graft biopsy also did not reveal anything and bk virus was negative that is yes. number one and then number yes. two um uh, we did some imaging you know, integrate pyelography and so on actually it didn't reveal any focus of uh, obstruction uh, but so uh, but the urologist felt that whatever worth it is let us go for stenting so after stenting there was mm -hmm. uh, a significant improvement in the graft function so it was left in situ but fearing then subsequent infections and all that then it was removed and then it was reinserted and so till the end actually we actually didn't know what exactly was the cause for this obstruction Yeah, and as professor sakuja rightly put it across it is not obstructive nephropathy it is the chronic graft dysfunction is due to a chronic abmr not due to the consequence of this so called obstruction yeah yeah that part i agree but i think we we failed to find the cause of this obstruction it was intractable we we, we did not succeed in finding the cause exactly sir exactly but yeah. we don't have any other uh, methodology to uh, unravel the cause for obstruction beyond this I, uh, yeah i agree uh, in I fact agree we thought initially why don't we go ahead uh, giving empirical att and so on but it it was of no avail then we decided not to go ahead with that mm -hmm. yeah and uh, the second thing uh, that i like to uh, ask dr vatsali and actually when you have a failing graft how will you manage the patient what what are the changes that you will bring about in the immunosuppression management of the patient actually uh, if the egfr is more than 40 and if it is associated with chronic allograft nephropathy uh, actually now there are evidence that uh, uh, pelatacept can be tried sir it has uh, shown that there is increase in uh, that we should uh, try cni avoiding uh, strategies like uh, pelatacept or uh, mtor inhibitors can be tried sir but uh, pelatacept there is in benefit and benefit txt seven year follow up study they have shown that there is a uh, significant improvement in uh, chronic graft survival uh, when uh, comparing cyclosporine with uh, pelatacept sir one and uh, if the uh, actually if the egfr has fallen to less than 40 and, and uh, if it is uh, going towards dialysis dependent state uh, we would like to uh, uh, based on the uh, facility whether the retransplant is available for that patient or not we will decide further management sir if the patient is uh, planning to undergo retransplant within a year uh, we would like to reduce anti metabolic by 50% we would like to continue cna and fitness loan and we work up for transplant and cutting sir but if the patient is having very high risk of uh, infection and if the patient is frail and if there is no uh, uh, chance of retransplant we would like to stop in stepwise manner initially uh, anti metabolites followed by uh, cna followed by fitness uh, loan very slow tapers so 1 mg per month but if the patient is uh, uh, the retransplant is uh, possible only after one month but there is low in risk of infection if the end patient i would like to slowly taper sir uh, in initial 3 months anti metabolites 50% then anti metabolites stoppage then cni by 50% and we will wait sir. it decreases okay. the in risk of uh, uh, intolerance to graft intolerance yeah that is the main uh, thing that you have to be careful about so you're right here yeah. so you first will reduce the anti metabolite or take off the anti metabolite the second step will be to reduce the cni and you leave the steroids on for even up to 6 months after the start of uh, maintenance dialysis so the steroids are the last drugs to be withdrawn in that situation and of course you should also look after things like you know i am plan, planning a preemptive transplant if it is possible uh, arranging for a vascular access if the patient does not have a vascular access already so, so so those things should also be done well in time and management of the ckd just as you do pre transplant should be of of course done in uh, all these patients and uh, in patients who have we has one other question in patients who have significant protein urea uh besides uh, uh, chronic abmr or transplant glomerulopathy 
what other differential diagnosis would you entertain for the cause of graft dysfunction fsgs can occur in post transplantation yeah i think you should talk about recurrent gn recurrent gn okay yeah recurrent gn can it can uh, affect various kinds of depending on the native kidney gn that the patient had so of course you may not always know that unless a biopsy has been done pre transplant so you can apply a label of recurrent gn only if you have the the basic disease diagnosed by a biopsy but the, the this is the other important cause of graft loss to consider uh, if there is significant proteinuria right so so you could have recurrent fsgs you could have recurrent iga nephropathy these could be very important causes of uh, de declining graft function and uh, ultimately of graft loss so, so in this case uh, dr basil what is your diagnosis now now uh, patient is in dialysis so chronic graft function with ckd5 tb stage uh could we have done anything different uh, uh i'll ask dr fernando professor fernando uh because this is one uh, case that uh, uretric stenosis and patient presenting with uh, the hydronephrosis and obstruction uh, we ha i had a similar case but this patient presented almost 25 years after the transplant he presented with the features of obstruction and, and to be honest that was my first transplant i did after my dna so that this patient five years back and 25 years transplant he presented with obstruction and at that point of time you can only and the minimal immunosuppression was minimal so whatever viral markers you can check you check but you we were at a loss to find, say the cause and eventually again a stenting was done and he improved uh anything else we could have done or anything in the management your comments so the obstructive nephropathy the patient, patient has it is a chronic abmr which has uh, uh, put the patient down right. maybe it did we falter sir actually this patient has a very poor follow up sir actually uh, so uh, i am still suspecting there may be non compliance in this patient because there is no reason the first is that whatever rejection he had after 7 months that was never completely reversed so logically the outcome is going to be poorer only rejections early rejections which occur and if there is a complete reversal then possibly you say that the impact may not be much but such patients who go back with 2.1 creatinine and coming with 1.3 initially logically they are going to have a bad outcome and secondly possibly as you said because of the covid times there was no follow up of the patient and one is not very sure about the compliance and it is not what is killing him is the obstruction obstruction was tackled but as professor sapuja mentioned possibly it is a chronic apmr which is harming him. any comment from uh, professor fernando then we we'll last of the part uh, regarding the apmr i think and, and, uh, any, any teaching point for students because you have mentioned about acute rejection we have mentioned about chronic uh, what is your protocol for students sake uh, for managing t cell rejection Acute. So if it is if it is a uh, T cell mediated rejection, we would treat with the treat with the methylprednisolone. Are you giving with five hundred milligram steroids every day? Are you are giving two fifty? What is the protocol you are following? Depends on how severe it is. If you would give five hundred mg for three days, or give five hundred mg on the first day and make it two fifty on the next two days, and if the there is an improvement in creatinine, we would. and if i don't find any overt infection i would probably extend it for another two days not in all and if there is a persistent rejection i would definitely consider giving thymoglobulin for a tcm okay. so the one approved indication for uh, thymoglobulin is uh, t cell mediated 
resistant uh, T cell mediated rejection. And of course, a T cell mediated rejection is a risk factor for ABM. So if he is not responding, yeah. I would still repeat a biopsy and look whether he's got ABMR and then treat ABMR uh, the, the way that it's done. Mr. Guja, that is the, uh, uh, your uh, policy, sir, about the treatment of T cell mediated rejection. Similar? Yes, yes, absolutely similar. No, no real difference between what uh, we do and what uh, Dr. Edwin said. No, that's what I said. For students, say that it is uh, three to five days, depending on the yes, response you are giving. And uh, generally, uh, is there any role of oral medication steroids? Some patients say, I don't want to get admitted, or it is a you are going, giving a teleconsultation these days. So, and you find the person has got this. Any but equivalence of oral? That's well, we, we generally haven't uh, advised oral. Generally, we insist on uh, the same regimen that Dr. Edwin mentioned. Generally, we insist on that. Mm. So they can come in as outpatient and then have this injection and go away also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or they can get it done at the nearest clinic that they have. So, if they are not willing for admission, that could be advised. Uh, Professor Gopal, I think he is around. Professor Gopal, uh, yes, sir. Actually, yeah. now your we, comments. We, we are I not. Think. We have we have come down on uh, the dose of methylprednisolone for T cell rejection, unlike in the past. Uh, three consecutive days, the total cumulative dose not to exceed one gram. Okay. Because of the high incidence of infectious complications, they get like uh, CMV reactivation, tuberculosis reactivation, fungal infection, all these things are pretty high because we are catering to the lower socioeconomic strata and so on. So we don't exceed one gram in uh, th three consecutive days and so on. So that's it. And coming back to this patient again, and the final impression is that, unfortunately, this lady had a BMR in the past and which could not get reverted because it was a late onset ABMR. That is seventh month post uh, transplant in spite of IVIG and plasmapheresis and other measures. And there has been a smoldering damage ongoing and other assaults where the reduction in the immunosuppression during COVID, then a doubtful non-adherence to immunosuppressive medications. These might have added to the DSA load of this patient that might have happened. So the final <coughs> kidney biopsy, which has revealed is uh, uh, the kind of a chronicity of the ABMR. So that is the primary cause for chronic graft dysfunction. And the, the role of CMB and the possible obstruction, we are not sure, the possible obstruction of the system, they, at the maximum, they might have had a temporary exacerbation of the graft dysfunction, but probably they were not the culprits for causing the chronic graft dysfunction in her. So the, the most important contributor for the chronic graft dysfunction in this patient is chronic ABMR. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have audience. any specific therapy for that. Uh, there's a question for our audience. Could COVID be responsible for ongoing slow rejection in the graft? No, COVID has not been shown to cause uh, a direct rejection. Uh, there are many papers which have analyzed on this, but for one or two authors, most of them, they don't believe that COVID per se can, can cause uh, rejection. But the rejection incidence is little more during COVID uh, uh, pandemic because of modulation of the immunosuppression which we have done. So it is a big question mark whether COVID virus per se can cause immunomodulation and culminate in rejection. So far, the answer is not very clear. Most of the most of the investigators don't believe in that. I think we had a very fruitful discussion. Uh, just, just one question to Dr. Vatsalian. What were the tacrolimus levels in the... Uh, the months and the years after transplantation, what information do we have on the tacrolimus levels? In this patient, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah, in this patient, it was fully in the therapeutic range. So in the initial three months, it was from uh, six to eight. Then in okay. next, uh, or till one year, it was from uh, so around six, sir. Then after that, it was from uh, five to six. That rate. It was all the time the tacro level was within normal rate, sir. Within the desired range, you find. But while we measured, it was in desired range. Okay, right. Because I was uh, there's been mention of non-adherence. But so uh, at least at least no. the levels that you are aware of were uh, adequate. 
Uh, we are aware of, but she didn't turn up for one year, sir. Actually, one year she didn't come. Only proxy visit she got trucks. So we were not aware at that time. Sir. At that time, proxy we, we, visit meaning proxy visit meaning uh, the patient's uh, attendant somebody will come and collect the drugs, not the patient not turning up. That we that he calls as proxy visit. So for yeah, one year she didn't uh, uh, attend face to face mm. the transplant clinic. She was yeah, just getting was, the drugs. Was the tech level monitored during that? No, one during that time it was no, not monitored. Time, no. Ah, yes. So yes. there could be a problem with those. That's why. That's why we surmise an element of non-adherence too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think that has to be kept in mind. Uh, what levels you are keeping after one year, Basile? Around five, sir. Tech level was around five. Around five. Okay. I think that is the recommendation at present. We should keep it around five because many people want but keeping it on lower side three four which possibly in the long run is detrimental uh, i'll request professor sapuja to say a few words and then conclude the session so one, uh, one right comment can i can i just make one comment yes, please please even after the uh, abmr was treated and the creatinine came down to 2.1 one year, six months when she came in, the creatinine was 1.5. Yes. Yes. Sir. So, yes. though there, there was no immediate uh, I mean, response to the MBMR treatment, the creatinine still came down to one point. So, this again pushes us to the point that. We uh, um, seem to have lost the audio. Yeah, we. We'll yeah, yeah. Dr. Edwin's uh, audio is a little lost. I think he is, must be rejoining, sir. I think we have lost him. Yeah, we have lost yeah. the connection. Hmm. I'll request Professor Sakuja to conclude. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Varma. Uh, I think it has been an, an excellent uh, discussion to which both uh, Dr. Gopalakrishnan and uh, Dr. Edwin has uh, have contributed uh, significantly. Uh, um, of course, uh, I think uh, one thing that is underlined by the uh, outcome in this patient that we have discussed today is the difficulty in managing a transplant recipient in achieving a good outcome. So, uh, so I think residents need to understand this, that getting a kidney transplant done is something like buying a lottery ticket to some extent. And uh, despite all your efforts to uh, achieve the ideal outcome, you may still fail despite uh, you, you are having done uh, a perfect job from your side. So that is what uh, uh, the take-home message is, that um, managing a transplant recipient is always a very tricky situation, and you can never guarantee outcomes yeah. uh, in this setting. I think that is the... Yeah. And, and you also that I would leave in you between with. mentioned that uh, the... Dr. Vasalyan also did a very good job. Yes, he was, yes. He was well prepared and uh, with all the trials and things, I think he also did a compliment. Did a good job. Sure, sure. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Can you give it to Mr. Raja for anything? Uh, sir, uh, good evening. Uh, Dr. Edwin, sir, you would like to make any remarks because we felt that you. Sorry, I just got cut off. So the yes. uh, the story that the non-compliance was there is probably strengthened by this fact. <clears throat> Number one. Other, other reason why C4D can be negative is when you do a very early biopsy, C4D can be negative. Or when there's a very severe tissue necrosis, C4D can be negative. So these are two situations uh, where uh, you know C4D can be negative. Or when there's very severe rejection. So these three possibilities could also lead to a C4D negative ABMR, mm. in addition to the non-HLA antibody mix. Mm. Uh, just one last, one last comment. Uh, during this COVID pandemic, 
video consultations and proxy visits have become extremely common and that habit seems to be persisting even persisting. though covid is even now. over and i think uh, this should be dissuaded yes this needs to be stopped and uh, patients should not get into this habit they should come out of this habit and they should come directly to the physician for a visit uh, i i would strongly recommend that yes we agree sir okay. also the, another so, major challenge is uh, uh, non adherence we are developing newer strategies to overcome that but still you know we haven't really made inroads into that no and in our center patients are getting immunosuppression totally free of charges the consultation is free investigations are free and the immunosuppression is free still you know uh, the deeper yeah. psychology you know it requires a kind of a deeper psychological analysis as to why there is such a high prevalence of non adherence to immunosuppressive medications that's it true true absolutely true yes hmm. so sir can we call it uh, yeah. uh, yes yeah. yes yes so i think um, good evening uh, uh, students as well as all the related uh, faculties it's been a great honor to have dr professor edwin fernando as well as dr gopal krishnan today as uh, the faculties to mo- moderate this today session so i really thank them for sparing their valuable time uh, i also thank uh, dr p watsalian for his uh, very good presentation which would, i'm sure would have thrown a lot of light to all the fellow students mm-hmm. uh not but not the least i really express my heartfelt thanks to dr vinay sakuja ji as well as dr pp varma ji for having uh, been our course directors and help in identifying this topic and help us to take forward uh, throughout today's session so um, thank you once again all the students and uh, we really hope you enjoyed the program and we will look forward to meet uh, in our next uh, uh, next program shortly which will the date will be shortly announced thank you one and all Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you sir. Thanks bye a bye. lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.